Hello, and welcome to another podcast with Progressives for Immigration Reform. I'm Kevin Lin. I'm the Executive Director of Progressives for Immigration Reform, and I'm joined by Steve Lamb. Hi, it's good to see you again, Kevin. Absolutely, Steve. Always a pleasure. Now, Steve mm -hmm. is a member of Progressives for Immigration Reform's board, and Steve is actually going to be conducting the interview today because we have a fascinating podcast in store for you. A fellow by the name of Blaine Taylor, he is an independent contractor who works with several municipalities here in Southern California. And he, he's on construction sites day in and day out. And he's here to really blow the whistle. Yeah, you know, Blaine had a very interesting uh, call. He called our hotline basically. And uh, he, he has what it sounds like is gonna be some fantastic information for us on just how the industry's changed, uh, particularly on, on how the industry has changed. You know, I, I'm, I work in the residential area, mm -hmm. but he's, he's visiting job sites that are on the 600 unit apartment uh, size of project. So these are big projects. Big projects, and things have changed there and they've gotten even worse actually than they are on the small scale residential project level. Interesting. So interesting. It'll be an interesting interview. Well, without any further ado, the interview with Steve Lamb and Blaine Taylor. All right. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Steve Lamb. I'm with Progressives for Immigration Reform. And today I'm here with Blaine Taylor. He's a uh, deputy inspector for the city of Los Angeles. And, and before we get much into more, uh, Blaine, could you please explain to the normal civilians who aren't in the construction industry exactly what a deputy inspector is and what you do? Yeah, well, there's a, a the deputy inspector position is, uh, is a position that is independent of the municipal building department. Okay. Uh, there are certain aspects of construction that are considered special inspections and those have to have an ongoing or periodic inspection, meaning that somebody has to... Just stop you for a second yeah. there. So when you say ongoing inspection, what you mean is something like, if I'm doing a process and it has several different parts to the process that are critical, you stand by and actually observe me do that process, is that right? Well, a better... I probably should have said continuous con right. inspection. So for instance, if you're uh, installing epoxy bolts into concrete into concrete then I would be there to examine the embed depth mm -hmm. to confirm that mm -hmm. to uh, observe the holes being cleaned out the epoxy installed and the, the right hole size drilled etc something like that right, I okay. also do wood construction so there's nailing schedules that have to be inspected there are a series of earthquake connectors that have to be installed, a number of them per schedule, right. anchor bolts, etc. cetera. So some of that stuff can be done periodic, meaning that the job can be done, but it has to be inspected prior to the building inspector coming out. Right. And if there are any corrections that need to be, be made, then I would uh, indicate at that point what needs to be done before the building inspector comes out. So you had a, before you became a deputy inspector, uh, you had a career in sort of the Los Angeles area construction. Can you sort of tell us about how you got here very briefly and your early days in the, in the field and the various trades that you worked in? I started in the construction business when I was 18 in Florida with okay. a plumbing company. And I moved back to Detroit. And then in 1984, I relocated to Los Angeles and shortly thereafter became involved in the construction business. And I uh, was involved in all the different phases of remodel and uh, uh, additions in residential. Okay. So I was familiar with pouring concrete, framing, plaster, installation of, ut uh, of sinks and uh, heating, uh, plumbing, you know, all phases of construction. Then I became a general contractor in 1988. So in, in 1988, you were able to be hired to build a complete house or uh, any building. Yes, I, be, I became uh, I became a licensed contractor in 1988. Right. Okay. 
And so let's say it's 19, well, let's say it's 1988, the year you started as a contractor. Uh, if, if some guy was walking onto your job site and he was a, a framing contractor, what would his wage have been in 1988? Well, the, if I hired an, a framer to do a small addition, his wage at that time was $45 an hour. That was the minimum for a good framing contractor, a good carpenter. So that's like a guy, he can cut bird's mouths and he can cut stairs and he can bang together a room. Yeah, all phases of, right. of uh, framing construction. Uh, for, I'm sorry, I used a phrase that people outside the industry don't recognize. A bird's mouth is a notch that you cut in a rafter. That's the thing that's your roof above the wall. Um, so that it'll fit over the wall, but yeah. So, um, so you, you were getting not super skilled cabinet makers at $45 an hour, but you were getting guys who were completely competent to build a house off a set of plans. Yeah, they would be able to in, you know, in, install cabinetry, right. say for instance, pre-made cabinetry, repair cabinetry, right. or uh, duplicate uh, some rudimentary cabinetry. Right. Uh, that would be the standard uh, carpenter that was uh, would be paid 40, about $45 an hour at that time. Okay, and say someone, you're, you're hiring a, a person to run uh, the electrical in your house and install the panel. The, the wage on that between the crew members for the guys who are just running wire and, and installing uh, receptacles, and then what was the wage for the guy who was actually installing the panel in those days? It would be about the same. It, about it, it ran, bucks. Yeah, for a helper, it was about twenty-five dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. For a master or somebody who had could basically run a complete job, it was about forty-five dollars an hour at that time. And plumbers were roughly the same way, twenty-five, forty-five, somewhere in there. Yes, end. at that time, uh, most of the jobs, even for small jobs, they were bid out. But that was the going wage for for the. Plumber, that's what he would have to figure into for his cost. And his helpers typically got $25 an hour. And so you were in the construction business in California for a while, and then you left the area? Well, I was in the construction business for about, uh, actively, for about 10 years. Okay, so roughly till 1999, yeah. 98, somewhere there. Okay, and so then you, you left the state for a while. Well, what I what I did was I began to diversify. The the it okay. became increasingly more difficult to bid jobs where I could make earn a living on because of uh, the influx of the uh, illegal immigration. You know, uh, the illegal immigrants that came into the state at that time. Okay, okay so wait wait a second. Be, just because the illegals were here, suddenly you had a more difficult time getting contract signed because, because what happened when the illegal aliens came? Well, what happened was I would bid on the standard type of job that I was bidding on at the time, and somebody that had a crew of low-paid illegal immigrants would win the job. Right. And it became increasingly more difficult for me to pay my, um, my workers $20 an hour plus workers' comp, plus FICA, plus SDI, my, my minimum wage to build into construction was about 45 to $50 an hour. That's just for general laborers. Right, so, so your, your cost per hour, wages, overhead, insurance, all that kind of stuff is $45 an hour and you're being underbid by people who are bidding at considerably less. Yeah, at, at that time they would bid at 15 to $20 an hour. Okay, and, and so obviously w it's very difficult to believe that they had full insurance, for example, because their, their workers' comp on, on uh, a construction job would, would exceed almost their wage at, at that point. Yeah, with, absolutely. With the There's always been ways that uh, people have been able to shave off you know, their expenditures for workman's comp and for other insurances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether they reported less employees than they actually hired, or whatever. So you went from doing general 
construction, general building, and then you specialized. What did you specialize into? Well, I, I became more diversified. I started uh, working with uh, ceramic tile, started okay. importing antique building materials, ah. uh, and that was very lucrative at the time because I was one of the few that were, were doing that in Los Angeles. So that would be the 1990s, you were importing that, antique stuff from around the world. That's correct. Yeah. And, and then, kind of, as time went on, what happened with that business? Well, that business fell out uh, as well uh, in the uh, right around the housing crash. Oh, it's a 2008. 2008 uh, people stopped remodeling using high-end um, materials, right. and that that business just disappeared almost overnight. So, no more imported Italian tile, no more antique bronze work, no more antique wrought iron, no more rooms of paneling from England or France, that stuff just all, nobody wanted that anymore at all because it was, everyone was underground. Well, people stopped remodeling at that time yeah. as well. Houses yeah. didn't sell. Um, and at the, prior to that, people would buy a home and um, uh, completely renovate it, mm -hmm. and these were spec homes, and a lot of, I did a lot of work on spec homes prior to that. That market nearly just disappeared. Exactly. Yeah. And so, after 2008, then what did you do? Well, I, uh, throughout that period, I, I uh, remained uh, on and off in the uh, construction business, just doing piecework and working for other companies, mm -hmm. um, and I continued to do that, but not and as And what was a, your wage at that time? I would earn anywhere from uh, 25 to $35 an hour. So your, your wages from 2008 to, say, 2016 were actually lower than the wages that you were paying guys in 1998. Absolutely, yeah. We, there was a drastic uh, decline in, in wage. So like in wages, yeah. roughly 40% lower than, than your prior wage. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And, and the, the cost of materials, did that go down 40% too? No. If, in, no. if anything, it increased by 50% in that yeah. same time period. Yeah. And so, and, and, uh, so at, at the wages are dropping, the cost of materials are going up, the cost of housing is going up, uh, the cost of insurance is going up. So basically at this point in California, no one can possibly afford to pay a living wage and run a construction company and come in at where they have to bid at to get the job. Oh yeah, it's been, it was very lean for years for many contractors right. uh, during the, that period from about 2000 and I'd say about 2005 up and through until the last uh, five years or so. And, uh, and so then you became a deputy inspector. Yeah, I, I returned, I, I had moved to Idaho in 2010 and then moved okay. back in uh, 2015, okay. back to Los Angeles. And decided at that point that um, I would choose a different line of work in the construction industry and that as after I looked at everything, I decided that that would be the, the most lucrative uh, way to re-enter the construction business. So as a deputy inspector, you're actually making a living wage. Finally, after 20 years of low wages, I'm actually able to earn a decent wage again. Yeah. And it's really strange because as a young man, of course, just entering your working life, you were making a living wage. And then as you got middle-aged, the wage dropped, <laughs> which is like, you know, most people don't expect in their careers that they're going to start out at the top and they're actually going to fall below where they are when they start. That's, you know. Yeah. Well, part of it was due to the market, but then there's the other part that, that really pulled it down, and that was the influx of um, just a, a flood of undocumented workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I was also in the construction business for many years. And I still am as a designer, but my brother and I had a construction company, and basically we abandoned trade after trade after trade as it became just completely overwhelmed uh, with illegal aliens. And what we found was 
oftentimes people who were getting bids were getting bids to do the whole job for less than what we thought the materials were going to cost us. And we, we still to this day can't figure that out. Yeah. Um, and it's not... Um, so, illegal aliens. Um, we've got a huge, huge boom going on in construction in Los Angeles right now. It's probably the biggest boom since the 1920s. Mm -hmm. People from the rest of the country might not know that, but it's gigantic. Everywhere you go, there's, there's stuff being worked on, and there's a lot of skyscraper building and, and a lot of multi-story residential being built, in, being built. Certainly that's not being built by illegals, is it? Uh, unfortunately, what I have found is that um, it's overwhelmingly uh, being built by illegal immigrate, immigrants that have uh, uh, basically taken over every trade. So, to, to, just to go back for a second, okay. to take a step backwards, um, in the 80s and early 90s when I was a contractor, mm -hmm. we, it, it wasn't unusual to see um, undocumented workers doing landscaping, demolition, okay. yeah. um, and then it became roofing yeah. and uh, concrete work. So yeah. the, the heavier, the harder, more difficult um, and dirtier sort of, you know, uh, trades, you know, where you actually, you know, got in the ditches. Uh, were the first trades to be taken over, then the rest of them began to fall, which was the drywall was next, painting, framing was the last, and now electrical and plumbing also have, have been taken over. So all the trades finally went to the Ill illegal immigrants. So on these construction sites, um, these, these tall, very complicated buildings, uh, that are, are being run by, um, well, that are being manned by illegal aliens. Does the majority of the workforce actually speak English? No. No, very little. Very few of them speak any English. It's usually the supervisors or the foremans that speak English, and many of those speak broken English. Okay, and that's very interesting because if you, if you look at the plans, plan check, of course, is still done in English. So the plans are all written in English. So what this means is that the guys who are working on the site don't actually have access to the plans of the building that they're being built. Well, they do. No, well, let's back up. They do have uh, plans. And typically when you build from plan, there's schedules in there which identify right. the uh the uh, materials that are being used. So that is, it's the same in English as it would be in Spanish. Well, except, and, and I designed, yeah. so I'm familiar with this part, when I do my structural details, right? Yeah. It used to be that 30 years ago when I did a structural detail, I would just call out a nail and say refer to the schedule. But every single detail now requires an immense amount of, of writing on that detail to describe exactly what you're doing. And Obviously, I mean, I guess perhaps the foreman is, is reading that and instructing the guys, but they're not really able to go look at the plans themselves if they have a question on the job and, and decipher what all that says. You know, like there'll be specific instructions about how to use the epoxy or, or how, how to nail or whether this nail does or doesn't get bent or, you know, leave this hole empty or things, very strange things like that. Oh, yeah, there's different types of conditions that would be um, written in English. Uh, right. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the plans are pretty ex uh, self-explanatory, and they do have a foreman who, at, at the very top, they, mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're legal. Uh, they're either green card holders or they're you know, born in America, uh, but they speak Spanish. And then they will then pass that information to the person directly underneath them and so on. But so the guys who are working on these, these complex buildings, though, I mean, even though they're illegals, they're probably getting a really good wage, right? I mean, they're probably getting $30, $40 an hour at least. Well, you would hope so, but the, you know, that the, the reality is that um, uh, a, a person that was hired as a laborer mm -hmm. in 1988, I paid $15 an hour, and 
within a month, if he if I could leave him on the job alone, I, he got twenty dollars an hour. Right. Okay. If I hired somebody that already knew how to do uh, uh, certain types of uh, labor uh, or certain types of um, operations, slightly more complicated. Yeah, operations. they would get twenty dollars an hour. Right. Now the average wage. Uh, in Los Angeles for construction workers is less than eleven dollars an hour. Holy crap, it's basically minimum wage. I mean minimum wage is like yeah, what, it's, nine they, bucks, they, have, they can't go lower than minimum wage. And then much of that, uh, if they're not being paid uh, by the hour at less than eleven dollars an hour, they're getting paid per piece, per piece of plywood that's installed, per piece of drywall oh. that's installed. Now they can now the, uh, the subcontractor, can circumvent uh, paying them or, uh, paying them as a, a hourly wage, and they, they are now being paid by 1099, which means that no taxes are being taken out. Right, right. <coughs> so they're so they're they're humping like crazy to get those panels up in any way they can, and and of course this probably doesn't lead to any short nailing issues or anything. <laughs> Well, that's my job. Yeah, now. your job is okay. See, to go back and make them renew. Yeah. Well, right. about five years ago, uh, Los Angeles decided to make wood construction a special inspection uh, uh, requirement for uh, the framing aspect of construction, and they what happened was they discovered that there were too many mistakes being made. Mm -hmm. And the building inspector, the city inspector, would go out. He would see two, two or three things wrong, and basically say, "Call me when it's finished." Right. Well, they got nowhere with that, so they decided to put in. They decided to uh, uh, in, uh, create the deputy inspector for wood construction, and that's what my license is: is for wood okay. construction. So I go out and I examine and make sure that there are the right number of nails in any given panel, the right number of earthquake connectors, um, the right number of anchor bolts, etc. Whatever is necessary and according to, that has to be done according to the plan, I have to make sure that it's done correctly and often I find mistakes. But you're saying that the wage for these folks now is anywhere between a quarter to a third of what it was in, say, 1992, 95, somewhere yeah, around there. About a quarter, yeah. It's, about a quarter. Yeah. At and, uh, $45 an hour for a framer in 1988, and now a framer is making less than $11 an hour. Yeah. And it's that's been a significant drop. And, and the demand, like we said, the demand is higher than it's ever been. We've We've got more building being built in, in Los Angeles than literally was built since the 20s. It's, it's an even bigger boom than it was in 1947 during the baby boom generation after the war. So now, uh, on the construction site, guys are making anywhere between a third to a quarter of what they made uh, in 1990 when, when you were paying people uh, what does that look like on the construction site? What, what kind of work are you having done? What are you seeing? And, and we'll start there, and then I've got a couple other questions related to okay. that. Well, the, the complexity of framing has grown as well with mm -hmm. the earthquake uh, requirements that are now uh, in place, as well as uh, there's retrofitting going on. Right. Um, and... Uh, when I was in the construction industry in the 90s, it was not unusual to see a few uh, Mexican-Americans, a few black people, and then most of the, uh, the rest of the work crew was white Americans. Mm -hmm. um, when I got back into the industry about two and a half years ago, I was shocked to see that there was no longer any white Americans, no longer any black Americans, and the almost the entire crew, approximately 98% were of Hispanic origin, and the majority of them were illegal. So what you're saying is that basically right now in Los Angeles, in the largest 
um, explosion of growth since the 1920s. Basically, there are now white American, black American, and hardly any Latino American workers working on the construction site that the vast majority of the workers on the construction site uh, are illegal alien Latinos. Yeah. Well, let me try to explain this a little clearer. Uh, I started as a deputy inspector about a year ago. Mm -hmm. I, since I started, I've been on probably 50 construction sites throughout Los Angeles. Now, these are not house sites. These are, these are major housing yeah, developments, like four or five commercial, six stories. Like, yeah, uh, large uh, residential, which would be 600 unit apartment buildings. Right. Um, some of the uh, towers that are being renovated downtown, 14, 15 story buildings, uh, and um, plenty of other, uh, uh, other types of wood frame construction throughout mm -hmm. the city. All the way from uh, Northridge to Anaheim, to Oxnard, to um, Long Beach, okay. and all the way out to Riverside. Uh, what I found is that for each job, there is about 98% Hispanic. I would say the top 5 to 10% would be Mexican-American. So they're born here, um, yeah, yeah, they're legal, bilingual. Or, or they legal. have green cards. Right. Uh, maybe two out of 100 or two out of 200 people are white. They're usually the superintendents or foremen. Yeah. And I've seen perhaps one black American on these large job sites, usually as a plumber or as a glazer or working with an electrician. But each job has at least you know, maybe one black person, two white people, and the balance is um, Hispanic. And 90%, I've, been, I've asked some of these foremen, just in conversation, how many of these people are, are illegal, how many of the workers, and they would often tell me 90%. So the foremen who are working on the jobs actually know that their workforce is not here legally. Yeah, absolutely. But it's become the normal, accepted way uh, for construction now. So, so these companies are paying these guys a quarter of the numeric dollars that they would have paid 30 years ago. So in terms of buying power, they're paying somewhere less than an eighth in terms of buying power. Uh, what they would have paid 30 years ago? I would say that's about it, yeah. yeah. They're, they're saving a huge amount. I did, I did a little bit of research and looked at a census study that was done in 2015, and they estimated about 325,000 construction workers in Los Angeles at that time. Okay, now there's a boom. There's probably more like 400,000, perhaps 450,000, and if you take into account, that's... 90% yeah, of those are <laughs> undocumented yeah. workers, yeah. and the average wage uh, for each trade, in, in, including uh, framing, has, has dropped drastically. Uh, this is a windfall for developers. It's a windfall for developers, but it's destroying the, the whole mechanism of money circulating throughout the economy. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there, you can't live on a wage of $11 an yeah. hour as a construction worker. Yeah. There's no hope for people, you know, young people. As a young, as a young man in growing up in Detroit, you look forward to hopefully working in the construction industry as a plumber, as an electrician, as a, uh, a framer, uh, a bricklayer. Because, but it was it was controlled by the union, and you had to have an uncle to get in, or you had well, to yeah. get on a list and hopefully get in. Yeah. But that was a a uh, an a, an attractive career to go into as a young person. Well, you were going to lead a, a middle to upper middle class life as a blue collar worker. Absolutely. In those days. Yeah. Um, so when you came when you came back in, when you found that the vast majority of of the workers were illegal aliens, um, what else did you find with that? Did you find that well, okay, they're here, they're not legal, but say their skill level is the same skill level that it would have been in 1992. You find that, well, yeah, but the skill level is okay. Well, no, the skill level is, is, is very uh, uh, piecemeal. The, the, the 
the people that we would hire in the 90s, early 90s, were carpenters. You could put them on the job and they could completely build with two men a house, mm -hmm. frame it out completely. Mm -hmm. They knew how to do every operation of the frame. They'd do the stairs, they'd cut the roof. Now they or... have guys that are doing nailing, okay, and, and framing. They're getting $11 an hour, and but they're only doing specific parts of it. They have, they've uh, pieced it out to there are certain individuals that'll put in the flooring, certain individuals that'll build the walls, certain individuals that'll do the shear panels, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, some that will just do the trusses, and some that just clean up, but the average wage there is less than $11 an hour for these guys. So they're not doing like what we did where you arrive on the job site and you know basically nothing except you got a new tool belt and some old guy like, you know. We've been home for this scraping run. That's okay. <laughs> What's that? The, the airplane, airplane oh, is yeah. like. Okay. Yeah, we, we had one go through earlier, but it was pretty low, low on the threshold. This one's about to drop a cluster bomb on us. We're okay now. Yeah. yeah. And thank you. So it's not like it was when we were young where you show up on a job site with a tool belt and you know like absolutely nothing and some old guy has you hump lumber for a couple of weeks and then he shows you how to nail and then he shows you how to tap and set and hit. And uh, you know, <clears throat> by the end of a year or two, you know, your your skill level is expanding. So, you know, you're you're learning more and more things as you go along so that you can do everything. These guys are, are stuck as sort of specialists, almost in like a, a Model T plant, Henry Ford's Model sure. T plant. Yeah, that's a, that's a good analogy for it. It's, um, uh, you, you'll have individuals that will uh, assemble walls. You have individuals that will uh, uh, lay the uh, flooring, individuals that will put the trusses in, and they're, so they've become sort of specialized in individual operations within framing right but they're not getting a specialist pay they're getting not some specialist pay that's no. really a wild, wild no it, so but these guys who get hired at a construction site today in los angeles they really have what do they have to look forward to to in terms of uh the expansion of their career and the length of their career well, I can't get into their heads, but I think what they're hoping for is just to go from one job to the next and earn $400 a week. That's, wow. you know, they, they have nothing else beyond that because they can't move into uh, general contracting on their own and they will, they'll never be a full, uh, you know, a master uh, carpenter. Uh, they're not learning all of the other uh, components that are needed to be a framing carpenter or a finished carpenter. So basically the, the, the entire concept of a skilled tradesman has, has devolved out of existence. Yes, it has. It's been dumbed down. It's been made uh, like an assembly line and they have certain people doing one operation, another group of people doing another and so on. Um, it's kind of there. Yeah, we're kind yeah. of. Yeah, we're kind of. Well, you know, um, Blaine, is there anything else you'd really like to say to us about kind of how you see? Wait, wait, wait. Well, I'm, I'm getting noise. Yeah, there's yeah, another there's, jet. There's a, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask you, you know, how you see the impacts and, and if you think there's any hope for American citizens in the trades in the future. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> well, beats the alternative. True, yeah. I like breathing. Breathing. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, we're good, sir. How you? Okay. you okay, Kevin? All good. All right. So, um, Blaine, you've been in the construction industry for, for a long time. Uh, what, what do you think, if any, the, the hope is for 
American citizens to, to re-enter the construction industry and to actually make a living wage? What, what would have to change in order for that to happen? Well, when I first became in, re-involved in the construction industry two and a half years ago, I was disheartened over mm -hmm. what I'd seen, the, the change that had taken place in the construction industry. Uh, however, as time has passed and I've been uh, looking and thinking, you know, it has to be taken back. We have to have Americans, legal uh, green, green card holders, um, young people, we have to get them reintroduced into the construction industry. Um, and it can happen. I, it, it's it's going to be a long process, but I would it would be great to see uh, the the companies held accountable for uh, hiring illegals. You know, there's laws in place; they're being ignored. Uh, there is uh, uh, huge amounts of taxes that are are being circumvented, uh, insurances being circumvented, and wages not being paid. There's got to be a movement to uh, take the construction industry back. Another thing that I've noticed that's peculiar about the building that's going on in Los Angeles is while we have the biggest boom, uh, we have almost entirely illegal aliens working, but also the owners of the companies doing the construction don't seem to be based in America. A lot of them seem to be based in Canada in Asia. Um, it seems like we have a, a system where there is absolutely no loyalty to, to the American people uh, in the companies that we're allowing to build skyscrapers in, in our city. Yes, the, there's the developer and then there's the construction company. Mm -hmm. They are able to avoid hiring documented legal workers, uh, they are able to avoid hiring uh, uh, Americans who would start out as an apprentice and then well, work let's, into... Let's, let's ask it again and then it's a little choppy. I okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's do it again. Let's okay. ask the same question again. Okay. All right. So Blaine, right now as we, as we look at Los Angeles, we're undergoing this tremendous growth in building. Um, the largest building they keep telling us very proudly, you know, Mayor Garcetti's constantly thumping his chest about it's the largest building boom since the 1920s. We've already talked about how most of the workers are not actually American citizens, they're actually here illegally, but as I drive around and I look at the buildings that are being built, they're, they're being built by non-national companies. The, the contractors and or the developers are Canadian or Chinese or British or um, how do you think that affects who gets hired on the job site? Well, the companies that are developers, they're coming from, they can be coming from anywhere. They, they mm -hmm. might be Chinese, they might be uh, Canadian, there's a lot of large uh, development developers that are Canadian. Mm -hmm. um, they're insulated because they're hiring contractors that are Los Angeles based who then subcontract out all of the other individual trades. These individual uh, uh, trades that are run by subcontractors are the ones that are hiring the illegals. So that insulates the developer. But the developer does know. Absolutely. I mean, I've been on jobs where the developer has their, uh, their staff on the job almost continuously. They deal with the, their superintendents. The superintendents then deal with the subcontractors. So they're insulated all the way through from any uh, obligation uh, to hire or to make sure that uh, the people that are working on the job sites are legally uh, uh, able to work on the mm -hmm. job site. Can, can you foresee any kind of regulatory or, say, job check system 
that would make it impossible to hire non-citizens on the job site. Absolutely. They would just need to enforce the laws that they have in place now. There are employee forms that have to be filled out that uh, secure the information that's necessary. You have to have a passport or you have to have a driver's license or a birth certificate or all three in, in many cases. But they're not doing it. They're not enforcing it. Well, Blaine, thank you very much. It's oh, been wonderful to talk to you today. My pleasure. All right. Steve, that was an amazing interview with Blaine. You know, Blaine gave us some really fantastic nuggets. And if you link some of these nuggets together, you can really understand how deep the wage theft is that's occurring uh, in our entire economy because of illegal immigration. Because what struck me, Steve, here we are in the biggest building boom since the 1920s in Los Angeles, yeah. and yet we're experiencing wage deflation. And interestingly, it's not just in construction, which is what you guys talked about, but we're seeing this in, in technology. Supposedly, where we have all this demand for people in the STEM fields, and yet when you look at the, the, uh, the, the quarterly reports from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, Wages are flat, and I got a feeling it's, it's, it all is due to immigration and these work visa programs. You know, I have a friend uh, who's actually a STEM graduate. She's a STEM graduate from UCLA, mm -hmm. graduated last year, and UCLA themselves say that their job placement for STEM graduates, now this is at UCLA, a UC, UC. no kind of a, a, a sloppy fourth-rate institution, you, you know, UC. Uh, their job placement rate for STEM graduates in the field is 19.5%. That's ridiculous. That's, that's and, like playing Russian roulette with your student loans. And, 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 you know, here they are. They're pushing everybody in America, STEM, 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 STEM. They're only placing less than 20% of their graduates at the best universities in STEM jobs. Yeah, we'll bring in 85,000 new H-1B visa uh, holders each year. Wow. And we have hundreds of thousands of several hundred thousand now in the U.S. working in STEM fields. But Steve, I want to get back. You had mentioned theft of wages. I, yes. I'm trying to get my head around what this number is. If you would okay. were to allow for normal wage inflation in the construction industry, mm -hmm. not challenged by unbridled immigration, any, I, I'm just trying to get my head around what would that be? Well, Kevin, I sort of have an idea. You know, in 1977, when I started working in construction, I was a you know, sort of general labor carpenter type person. And I was making about $17 an hour. Okay. And I had a weird old car and I used to take it to this place called Fremont and Purden in Pasadena. Now, minimum wage was like $3.84 uh, at that yeah, time. Yeah, just about, it was three, well, yeah, three eighty nine, I think, something yeah. like that. So it was, you know, it was a considerable bump above minimum wage. It was a great job to have as a college student. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so I would take my car to Fremont and Purden to get it worked on, and they charged seventeen fifty an hour when I was making seventeen. Okay, seventeen. Okay. Now I, I took a car to them to have it, them work on it uh, last month, and they're charging ninety six dollars an hour. So, the the construction wage, hmm. if it had kept up with the mechanics wage, and they were blue collar equivalent jobs. Uh, my construction wage now should be roughly $92, $94 an hour. And as Blaine told us, it's roughly $11 an hour. So that means there's a loss of $80 an hour. And, and what does that mean in total? Well, if we look at, we say, okay, there's 400,000 construction workers in the, the LA, right. Southern California mm -hmm. area. They work roughly 2,000 hours a year okay. full mm -hmm. time. Okay. And if there's an $80 deficit, that's $6.4 trillion in wages that are being lost. My gosh. Now, check our math on this, folks. We, 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 this was done probably, what, on a matchbook or in your head there, Steve. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's a huge amount of earnings loss. Now, it all goes somewhere. It went into someone's pocket, but it didn't get circulated into the, the normal uh, the Main Street economy. I actually speculate that some of it doesn't actually go somewhere. I mean, a lot of it does go to the developer, and in these large mm -hmm. projects, it goes to the uh, to the 
main contracting firm, but a lot of it actually is hiding the increased cost. You know, one thing Blaine went into is how much more difficult it is to like nail off a plywood panel right. than it used to be. Well, a lot of what's being hidden in the construction industry by low wages is the tremendous increased cost of code revisions since 1979. Okay. Uh, when, I, when I started, the, the building code was this thick. Hmm. The, the building code now reaches down to the floor and to here. My gosh. And so there you go. Instead of crying awesome. uncle 20 years ago, They've been a lot, that has been a lot, that's been enabled, essentially. Right, enabled. right, because there's no way you could have this kind of, of increase in cost if the wages were remaining the same. So part of what's happening is um, the low wages are hiding the increased cost due to regulation. But also, there's a tremendous amount of money that's, that's funneling upwards in, in the pyramid. Okay. Um, you know, it used to be that, like, Contractors who were at the top of the construction pyramid, they had a nice car, they had a nice truck, their wife maybe was a stay-at-home mom. Now guys who are in, in the top of that pyramid, you know, they've got a bass boat, they've got a couple houses, their house that they live in is like 6,000 square feet and gaudy as all get out, you know. Okay. So big, big change from just living a, a middle class to upper middle class lifestyle, which is what used to happen. Interesting. Well, it's... Uh... You know, uh, for those of you who sat with us through this podcast, I really encourage you, you know, take action. Call your congressman. Learn more. Uh, this, the Progressives for Immigration Reform uh, website and our archives are loaded with great articles, videos, podcasts. You know, educate yourself on immigration. As I'd mentioned when we started, you know, the, our goal of progressive immigration reform 10 years ago was to have this conversation with the Democratic Party and those are left-leaning brothers and sisters. And the Democratic Party is the party of labor. It is the party that protects the most vulnerable. And immigration, unbridled immigration, illegal immigration, isn't working for the constituents of the Democratic Party. In fact, it's hurting them. And there was a time when immigration was well regulated and restricted when it worked for everyone. It worked for the immigrant coming here. They weren't exploited. They earned living wages and they prospered along with the Native Americans that were here. Yep. So I encourage everyone to get involved. Uh, we'll probably never have an opportunity as we do now to solve this problem in a way that works for the American citizen. So again, please get involved.